What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? They learn important lessons on the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. This is true for both men and women. Ernst & Young found that a whopping 94% of women holding a C-suite position played sports. Their wins and losses shaped their habits and who they would become. Join me on my journey to sit with some of the brightest executives in the world as we discuss how sports shape their professional trajectory. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, the voice of America's CEO community. I'm your host, Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is the most highly acclaimed female sportscaster of all time, Leslie Visser. How cool is this? She's the first woman inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but she's also someone so amazing that GQ Magazine named her one of the five ideal dinner guests we could hope to have a meal with. Her lists of firsts are a mile long, including being the only sportscaster, male or female, to have worked on the network broadcast of the Final Four, the Super Bowl, the World Series, the NBA Finals, the Triple Crown, the U.S. Open, and the Olympics. Leslie served on the board of the V Foundation for 20 years, and she currently hosts a podcast called In Conversation with Leslie Visser, where she interviews the collection of friends she has made in sports, music, business, and Hollywood. I'm excited to hear stories from her journey and the lessons she learned along the creation of so many firsts. I want to be a sports writer. My mom didn't dissuade me from this idea, although she must have been shocked. It didn't occur to me that women didn't do this. Any leader can change anybody's mind, maybe even not knowing that they're doing it, but they can with the way they put something. And my mom didn't say to me, oh, you can't do that. Girls don't do that. She said, that's great. Sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. Leslie, thanks for joining us. Oh, it is so much fun to be with you. I can see why you've written 15 bestsellers and every athlete wants to speak to you, every coach. Thank you. You know, we had the chance to sit together at dinner at Dick Vitale's backyard just a few months ago at his gala. And I just felt an instant bond to you, like I'd known you forever. I'd admired you for so many years, not only because of the many firsts that you've achieved, but because of your ability to find and tell great stories. Walk me through your mind as you're building a story. What are you looking for as you're beginning to think about how you take something you get a chance to experience and how you put it into an experience that an audience can take from you? Well, as a great storyteller yourself, thank you for that. I have some non-negotiables. I think a story has to have a point. The characters have to be interesting or the story has to be able to overcome the lack of charisma of the character. And I also think it has to reflect a time and a place. When I was very young at the Boston Globe, they made me the first woman, as you might have mentioned, to cover the NFL as a beat. And the Patriots had a player named Jess Phillips punt returner and a pretty good player, fancied himself. I mean, he went to the London School of Economics for one summer. He was like an interesting character, but he had this thing for jewelry. And when he left the Patriots, he held up a jewelry store in Reno on vacation. The police said he ran like a deer. They finally cornered him. They shot him. He went to prison. And this was a guy, really, who carried a briefcase. How many NFL guys, you know, in the 70s carried a briefcase? Right. Most women really don't do stories in prisons, but he let me go see him in Reno. And it was just so sad how broken he was. Here he'd been, an all-pro in the NFL. He played for the Raiders before he came to the Patriots in a prison in Reno. He was, like, ashamed to see me because he was shot and... His face had been disfigured in the fall. And that one was like a real story that I could do all aspects of. How he grew up in Houston, was from a two-parent family, wanted to be 
something in his community. And then it just so fell apart. One thing that really strikes me about that is that you did that story 40 years ago. When a story is so good that the visuals of it come to life for you and you're able to relay them, you were able to paint that picture so well then that you can repaint it now, 40 years later. That's the real gift in great storytelling. Find those details that make the person and the story come to life. What is one way you go about trying to find the details that you know you can draw them into? I remember being a young writer at the Kentucky Derby. Back then, print was everything. You know, it was really, well, you were Sports Illustrated. I'd run to my uh, mailbox every Thursday <laughs> to read Curry Kirkpatrick. But they sent me to a Derby in like, must have been the late 70s. The greatest writer then was Red Smith, of course, the first sports writer to win a Pulitzer Prize at the New York Times. Red used to ask a young writer every year at the Derby to walk the infield with him. And that was like an enormous honor if you were anointed to do that with him. Red said to me, Leslie, I'm going to give you one piece of advice for your entire career. Wherever you are, whatever you're covering, make a memory. Mm. It was genius. It was genius. Every single time I went to cover something, I looked around. I took either mental notes or physical notes, or I made a snapshot in my head. Like I can see winning plays, you know, in the Super Bowl or the Final Four, and I can see what people were doing when I did a story on them. That ability to capture that memory and then be able to kind of put it into words for others. What a great gift from Red. And also what a gift for you then to keep giving to all the rest of us. You know, you spent your lifetime in the presence of some excellent leaders, John Madden, many others. Can you share an example of a great leader that you had a chance to work with where you saw in them the ability to bring others along? to do something they might not individually imagine themselves capable of being. So I was in college when Title IX had just been enacted and Billie Jean King really impacted me. She thought women would say it's not going to be worth anything. So she said, okay, I'm going to go out and play Bobby Riggs. It'll be before 60 million people in Houston's Astrodome. And I'm going to do it because I think it's meaningful, meaningful for women. I've had the privilege now for 40, almost 45 years of getting to know Billie Jean King really, really well. And now over the years, she's told me how she did that. She broke it down for me in real manageable parts, mental, physical, and emotional. The emotional part was, why am I doing this? I'm doing this, I believe, for women, for society, for the future, for the opportunities for women. What am I going to feel if I lose? Am I going to embarrass myself? Am I going to embarrass tennis? Tennis was fighting to be seen in the United States. This is well before Chris and Martina and all the great Jimmy Connors, Agassi Sampras. And she said, okay, if I lose to this old man, Bobby Riggs, who actually had been a Wimbledon champion, what's that going to do to me? What's that going to do to my self-esteem? Then she did the physical preparation. She went down to Hilton Head. She hit a thousand overheads because she thought that's what Riggs would do to her hour upon hour. It's like the great Ted Williams, everyone would say, oh, you're the most natural swing. And he said, yeah, a thousand at-bats a day. <laughs> right. <laughs> then she did the mental preparation, go down to the Astrodome to take a tour of it on an off day. What is the height? As you know, it was cavernous. Where will the fans be sitting? Who will accompany me? Who will walk me out to the court? I want to meet that person. I want to know that person. So that when the first serve went up, she felt she'd done every single thing she could possibly have done to give herself the best chance. And Billie Jean beat Bobby Riggs, which I thought was the seminal moment of the women's movement. It was gender equity, financial equity, societal equity. When she was asked after her 20th title, what kind of pressure was that? She looked at me as if she didn't understand the question. And her answer the first time I heard it, it actually changed the chemistry of my brain. She said, are you kidding? Pressure is a privilege. Wow. I like that. Yeah. Most of us think of pressure as the culmination of all these bad things that could happen. It only happens to you because you've earned that moment. Yeah. Welcome it. Embrace it. Yep. 
you know, of all the firsts you've accomplished, I know you're rolling your eyes. <laughs> no, I feel embarrassed <laughs> by it. I mean, it's, why? You know what? I felt there was that pressure that Billie Jean said to embrace. It was so noticeable, like you couldn't hide if you were the only woman. I mean, they had no ladies rooms when I started because there weren't any other women. I used to have to time it. I'd be up in the Patriots press box, first and 10 in their own 20. This was not the gold standard Patriots. They were going to punt very quickly. So I'd have to say, gee, can I get down the press box elevator across the field? You know, like Usain Bolt, use the one public restroom and get back. But I knew that anyone who came after me was going to see that it could be done. I felt like I was an authentic role model. When I speak, I always say, I, I don't care what religion you are, what color you are, what your background is. The job did not exist for women when I started. So I'm the example that you can do it. No matter what it is you want to do, I'm the example you can do it. Man, I, I mean, you, you, there's a humility in it. And I appreciate that. There's also the idea that you carved out space for so many other people. You talked about being a role model in some ways. I mean, even Savannah, our producer on this podcast, pointed out to you that she holds your book <laughs> that her mother gave her a couple of years ago, having I no idea it. that she'd end up in this conversation <laughs> because you are a role model to her. Like, I'm inspired just to be in your company. Oh, gosh. And thanks to Savannah and her mom. Well, is there one of which you are most proud? One that you look back and you go, forever, I will be able to be grateful that I got to be first into that booth or first into that moment. I was really, really overwhelmed when I got the call to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I was just a kid who loved football. I had no natural advantages. My dad was raised in Amsterdam. My mom, a teacher from a dignified but lower middle class Irish family to think I would get a call. And I remember when they called me, I said, okay, you can't take it back. You can't say you have the wrong number <laughs> because it was just so impossible to fathom. I felt like I had done it honorably. I really loved the sport. I spent a lot of time learning the sport. I traveled John Madden's bus with him all those years and quizzed me. Actually, John wrote me a note after I got the call and he said, the hall of fame, you can't be born into it. You can't buy your way into it. You have to earn it. Mm. And I never would have imagined it, but the greatest opportunity of my professional career was only tangentially part of sports. CBS sent me to the fall of the Berlin Wall. East Germany had gone from winning like two medals in the Summer Olympics to like 100. You know, it was clearly the Stasi doping system. You know, Dan Rather, everybody else led the CBS coverage. But my little slice was how would sports change in East Germany after the wall fell, after the reunification, going from Berlin into East Berlin, just going through Checkpoint Charlie, it was like you went from color to black and white. The people were huddled and their heads down and toilet paper was like sandpaper. The hotel was all broken down. And for what, a half a mile and a philosophical difference, people lived entirely differently. My dad, who was not Jewish, had grown up under the Nazi occupation for five years. Rotterdam was bombed in 40. Holland was liberated in 45. So for me to see people who had walked from Dresden and Potsdam with nothing but a backpack to get through the Brandenburg Gate just to taste freedom. Wow. Isn't that fun that your career, which was largely in the world of sports, did a highlight for you you wouldn't pick a Super Bowl. You wouldn't pick an Olympic moment. You would pick that opportunity given to you professionally to see the world from a different vantage. Yeah, well, it was one of the great stories of the 20th century, the fall of communism and the Berlin Wall. And to be there as a witness to it and CBS to have entrusted me with reporting on just one slice of it was very meaningful to me. And I took it very seriously. You know. When you were 10 years old, your mother gave you some valuable advice that became the title of your book. Can you share it with us? Yeah. Having the enormous benefit of being born in Boston. I'm a child of the Red Sox. Imagine my first childhood memories were of Ted Williams, Bobby Orr, and Bill Russell. Great. 
great greater. Well, it was ridiculous. I think the Celtics didn't lose until I was in high school. Right. They were a team. Everything was a team because they were great teammates and teams that succeeded. And my family moved a lot. We moved 11 times when I was a kid. And by the way, didn't, were you born in Hawaii? I was, that's correct. <laughs> and then lived crazy places yourself? A few, yes. Yeah. But I don't have the Boston, like, you know, University of Hawaii, we had Golden Richards and that's about it. <laughs> well, the great Al Michaels. That's right. I've done the World Series, Triple Crowns and Monday Night Football with Al. So I, I know him really, really well. Al, for people who don't know, started his career in Hawaii doing high school basketball. So one time I said to him, your great question, Don, what do you think made you great? And he said, five Samoans on a fast break. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If you could, if you could pronounce the names before the time they get to the other end of the court, you set yourself up for life. Yep. But um, we were living in Cincinnati and my mom said, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? And I said, you know what? I want to be a sports writer. It didn't occur to me that like women didn't do this, but any leader can change anybody's mind, maybe even not knowing that they're doing it, but they can with the way they put something. And my mom didn't say to me, oh, you can't do that. Girls don't do that. You know, you'd be a nurse or a secretary or a teacher, or domestic, all very honorable professions. But she didn't dissuade me from this idea, although she must have been shocked. She said, that's great. Sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. Isn't that the best? Obviously, that stuck with you, just like pressure is a privilege, just like Red Smith. Yeah. You know, our research team was able to find your high school yearbook. I love when our intern team does that. <laughs> the pictures are in our show notes. Okay, good. But in high school, you played field hockey, basketball, track. You were captains of all of those teams. And a cheerleader. Don't leave that Cheerleader out. and a Glee Club member. Glee Club. And a writer for the school new newspaper, The Spotlight. What did playing sports do for you in your ability to engage others in sports as you began your writing career? I'm always wary of people who think that you have to play a sport to cover a sport. Al Michaels never played a down. I myself never played a down and we're both in the Hall of Fame. It's more, did you have a passion? But I did love sports. It was out in the Berkshires of Massachusetts. and this is going to sound like the 1800s. When I played high school basketball, there were six girls on a side and two of us were the rovers that we could cross half court because there was a thinking that women would become too exhausted. The same reason they couldn't run in the Boston Marathon. We had hand-me-down uniforms. I mean, really, the prejudice was just insane back then. It was not what high school sports are for girls now, but it was great learning. And I loved my coaches, which to me made all the difference. Peg Levitt. Oh my gosh. Coach Levitt. She actually came to see me one time in a Monday night game in Indianapolis. <laughs> and how deep into your career is this? Probably 25 years ago. 25 years later. Oh yeah. Easily. Yeah. Maybe 30 years later. She showed up to see you at a game. And I went back to speak at her when we lost her a few years ago. Oh, she was so meaningful to me and she knew field hockey. I mean, she was like a real student of the game. And I remember she thought I was pretty good. And she sent away for a real field hockey stick for me. So, I mean, I had my own because she believed in me. She made everybody feel like you can do it. And John Madden used to say his second year as an assistant coach to Al Davis with the Raiders. He was very young. Vince Lombardi was on the other sideline in the Super Bowl. It was the Raiders Green Bay. John just could not believe that he was looking across the field at Vince Lombardi. So he managed to find a way, got to know him a little. And he told me he's once spent six hours with Vince Lombardi, just talking about leadership, preparation, how to handle a team. One thing that Vince Lombardi told him was don't chew your players out when they lose. Everybody's getting on them. Their wives are getting on them. The fans are getting on them. The guy at the grocery store is getting on them. The time to chew them out is when you win three in a row. I love every time I've talked to you, you bring up John Madden because his impact on you is so real, not just in football, but also just in the way he encouraged you to be so knowledgeable so that no one ever questioned your credentials. 
you made the point. There are athletes out there. We've heard them even as recently as the last few weeks who have criticized female broadcasters or criticized people in the world of sports media because you didn't play the game. You can't talk to me about it. Talk to me about Madden's influence on you. Yeah, he was truly a teacher. He was one course shy of a PhD. No kidding. Yeah, and he was a real estate mogul. He lived in the Dakota. It's very old. The famous, of course, on the Upper West Side in New York. I used to go over and watch Monday Night Football because, of course, we all had games on Sunday. John Lennon lived there when John lived there. Gladys Knight lived there, and she'd call him Big John, and he taught her to sing midnight train to georgia or whatever it was he taught her to sing or she taught him i'm sorry she taught him i was gonna say boy if john madden was teaching gladys no, knight to sing no no i'm <laughs> sorry yeah no but there were all these people in the building that john was just a sponge he wanted to learn everything from everybody he invented the madden game when trip hawkins who was a young harvard graduate came to john and said look we can do this but we can only get seven people on a side to fit the pong machines. And John said, forget it. The game is played with 11 on a side. If you can't do that, I'm not interested. <laughs> Obviously, they worked it out and electronic arts became enormous. I got to be the voice on the Madden game in the early years, doing the same thing. Sideline reporting, you know, took days because you had to do every player plus every possible injury. But that's that commitment. John had it to business. It was going to be as good as it could possibly be. I remember once years later, we were on the bus doing a Giants game, and Dave Brown, who was quarterback for a little bit with the Giants, came on the bus and he said, Coach, why does my ball always wobble on the Madden game when I throw longer than 10 yards? John just kind of shrugged. Well, that's what happens when you throw it longer than 10 yards. <laughs> It's like, I've watched your ball and it wobbles. Yes, of course. Did you ever play Madden with John Madden? Yeah, I did. And um, no, he wasn't really good at it <laughs> at all. <laughs> Pat Summerall was the voice in the early years too. And I think Pat crushed him. But he hired young, eager people who were also willing to make that commitment. One time on the bus, he wanted me to be able to diagram the then Redskins' famous counter tray play. He would play it over and over again on the bus. Now, do you see what the nose guard is doing to counteract the left tackle or whatever? So then I diagrammed it, really diligently wrote down all the X's and the O's and how they would pull and where Riggins was doing. And I handed it over to him like a proud student. And um, I thought I really had a handle on it. Maybe like 20 seconds later, he looked up and said, I don't think this formation has ever been seen in the history of the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it again and again and again till I got it. But what was so great about that is he was investing in your knowledge of the game. You talked about him as a sponge. You proved to be an equal sponge. Yeah, yeah. And he was a modern Mark Twain. Like a lot of people were like, why are you taking the bus? You know, why don't you fly? Of course you can fly there which I did many times, but he had so many observations. He'd look out the window and out of nowhere, he'd say, dark chocolate. I don't get it. It's like they got halfway to milk and quit. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I think is at the root of that? Because you have this too, obviously, or you wouldn't be where you are. And most of the people we talk to have had this. Joe DiMaggio's theory, which I think applies to both of us, I try to treat every at-bat as a quality at-bat. The great ones just don't cut corners. They treat every at-bat as a quality at-bat. It is. It is that willingness to do the research and to be so well prepared into our conversation. You know, when we sat down, you knew so much more. I just was so impressed. And I remember sharing that with my daughter later that night after we had dinner. Gosh, if we could all do that, Imagine how much more vibrant every engagement would be. Well, you're pretty well known. <laughs> I couldn't wait to meet you. By the way, how cool is Jeanette? Good job there. <laughs> yeah, it's about uh, kicking your coverage. Yeah, <laughs> but your books do that. The one thing where I think we differ, and maybe you could coach me on this, I think we have the same basic qualities about what we think it is to experience greatness or to earn greatness. But I haven't found that many people 
turn to their faith as you have. I found faith in themselves, faith in their team, faith in their parents. Tell me, did you either draw that out of them or if I dug a little deeper, would I find that? That's it. A big part of it is, as we have identified, sometimes it's in the questions we ask. Faith, I grew up the son of a preacher, maybe. I dig a little deeper there because I'm fascinated by so many people who see themselves as great. We assume that they think of themselves as the be-all, end-all of most conversations. And some that is true. But others, the further you dig, the more you begin to realize they do have some level of perspective. And perspective helps us, I believe, to see it slightly differently, like pressure is a privilege. You took pressure and you go the other way. I ask questions about faith in part because I want to understand, did that play a role in their personal development of their thought process? You know, you're teaching me something so interesting. Maybe there was a faith there that I just never ask them how meaningful was it or was it not to you? That's interesting. Only Leslie Visser can turn this into an interview of me. <laughs> well, I'm here to like steal all your great ideas and thoughts. <laughs> so you frequently give this advice to other people. When you make a mistake, the best thing to do is to own up to it. Can you tell me a little bit about how that advice became so important to you? Oh, I love how you did that, because basically what you're saying is bring up your most embarrassing moments you've ever had and stick a pin in your own eye. But OK, here we go. But I'm letting you do it <laughs> around your own quote. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's true. No, no, I've had some doozies. But um, I learned it early in my career, which is good. You know, we all have scar tissue. The Boston Globe made me the first woman to cover the NFL as a beat. It was the New England Patriots. They were playing Miami and Miami then was great. Their defense was great. And. I was so nervous, Don. I brushed my teeth in my AMC Pacer, one of those <laughs> terrible cars. Yeah. There was all glass, so they wouldn't get cold in the summer and they wouldn't get hot in the winter. <laughs> but I drove all the way down to the Patriot game. They had two players, Bob McKay and Tom Neville. I can picture them. The two left side of the line. Both were a little bit injured. And I asked Chuck Fairbanks, who, of course, thought it was from Mars, like, who is this? 21 year old, 22 year old woman. Why is she asking these questions? Coach, who's going to play against the Dolphins? Who's going to start? He said to me, Neither one can play the position. Well, I got in my AMC Pacer and I drove back to the Boston Globe at a thousand miles an hour. This is unbelievable. Coach says nobody can protect Steve Grogan, that it's just <laughs> going to be the Hoover Dam breaking. So in the paper the next day, you know, of course, it's uh, Chuck Fairbanks says no one can protect Grogan. Here's his quote. And my phone started ringing. I'm going to say it's six o'clock in the morning now, way before answering machines, anything like that. And I pick it up and I hear, you know, words you don't hear in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, just Coach Fairbanks reaming me like you can't believe and I said, coach, what's the problem? And he said, I said, either one can play the position. <laughs> either, neither. Can I buy a vowel? <laughs> yeah. It was pretty bad, though. It was really bad. And it was bad. And it was bad. I mean, you're going against the Dolphins. They had great defense then. Will McDonough, we had on football. And I called Will crying. I said, oh, my God, Will, what am I going to do? And he said, go down there and you wait till the entire team shows up, including Coach Fairbanks. And I did. Boy. I did. And it was, I'm sweating right now thinking <laughs> about it. I went down there. Fairbanks saw me kind of like a, okay, get over here. And I was coach. That was terrible. I wish I could have bought every single Boston Globe. <laughs> and he said, you just learn from this. He was really great that way. Did he really say that to you? Yep. Now, what a gift that is. Too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think he respected that I went down there. I didn't just like sort of hope it went away and because he had already killed me on the phone. <laughs> you just learned from this. You just learned from this. And then, of course, it became like a joke for the whole year, you know, as it went along. But it was great advice. Face the mistake. Don't hide behind it. I love it. We have a phrase at our little company. Bad news doesn't get better with time. Oh, that's fantastic. If there's a moment, if you've made a mistake, if you've put something out and think, oh, I'm not going to mention it and it's going to get better, that just doesn't happen. Oh, bad news doesn't get better with time. So true. You know, one of the most overused phrases today, I think, in corporate America 
is my team. People refer to their organizations as teams. We know that most organizations are truly a bunch of independent contractors who might all just have the same paycheck. You've been around great teams. You've witnessed the building of extraordinary organizations. If you were offering advice to some young leader who's trying to build a team, what are some of the things that you've seen in the best teams you've been around that we might want to model? The best leaders don't go any faster than the person in the room who might be learning it the slowest, mm -hmm. because that's how you lose people. Break it down into manageable bites that everyone understands his or her responsibility, also what you're trying to achieve as a team. I've not only witnessed it in many teams, I've experienced it. I mean, the NFL today, we were a team. Terry Bradshaw and Pat O'Brien and Greg Gumbel, Jim Nance, Boomer, we all moved as a team. Building camaraderie is really, really important. That's what teams do. Right. Did I tell you my great Dan Marino story? That's another really embarrassing moment for me. Oh, no, but let's share embarrassing moments. Okay, because this is just among you, Savannah and me, correct? Yeah, we're just nobody listening. Okay. Another time I was on the NFL today, you know, it was like Greg Gumbel and Dan Marino and Shannon Sharp and Boomer, I guess, Esiason and myself. We used to go out to dinners. I remember we were all having a dinner right after Alvin Harper, who'd been a receiver. He, he was the first person anyone could remember to dunk over the crossbar. And Shannon Sharp said, oh, you know, I, I could do that. And I said to Dan Marino, could you do that? Dan said, yeah, yeah, I, I could have done that. I said, oh, come on, Dan, really? And he finally leaned over to me and he whispered, Leslie, I'm Dan Marino. <laughs> <laughs> of course, right? He was drafted in three sports, one of the greatest athletes of all time. But in case you just needed a reminder. Yeah, just don't go down the path you're going, Leslie. He was saving me. Everybody else at the table is like, you know, what kind of a nitwit you know, would be saying that? You know, you mentioned your father earlier, grew up in Amsterdam. He had little interest or knowledge about sports, but you said in an interview with our mutual friend, Susie Schuster, I love Susie. Love her. That it was your mother who got you to love sports. Tell us about how your mother pulled you into sports that way. Oh, thanks for asking that. Yeah. I know this is going to sound crazy. My mom, her image of Jesus was Bill Russell at the foul line. <laughs> <laughs> so you wonder why I'm kind of an outlier. <laughs> In later years, not long before she died, you know, I was covering the Big East then, and she'd watch Big East triple headers. I think she loved the same thing I did, that sports, it's the ultimate meritocracy. It doesn't matter where your mother went to college, how much money your father has. It really is, do you hit the jumper? Do you sink the putt? And then you can also do that within a team. But people have to know it's a meritocracy. So several years ago, Chevron hired me to do a number of events for them for their diversity and inclusion seminars that they were doing. And I thought that's interesting. But the reason was because they saw the same thing, that sports was the place where it didn't matter if you were white or black, whether you were born on this side of the tracks or raised on that one, that at the end of the day, the question was, are we additive? Are we better because we're together? That's what a real diversity program is. We're looking past everything. And they thought that sports was the model that they corporately wanted to follow, where we looked past everything else to say, are we better because we're in this together? Yeah. So I would say, besides the fact that, well, no, maybe number one is that you scored on Michael Jordan, which is just so insane. But number two, which I would put number one because I'm a child of the Celtics, you spoke at something and Bill Russell was in the audience taking notes. I'm telling you, that was still to this day. I remember and when Bill passed, Michael Orr, who was with me, oh, right. Michael and I were talking about that. And we were just marveling at this idea that the greatest was there. But that's why he was so special. It's why John Madden was so special. To be in the presence of exceptionalism is to learn a trait from every one of them. Bill Russell, who now I'm sorry because I can't ask him about the influence of religion in his life. He was certainly his own man. If you called him up in Mercer Island, you'd get the machine and this is what it would say. If I wanted to talk to you, I would have called you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's ready. And if you're lucky enough, he'll return the call.
you know, Leslie, you're in the Pro Football Hall of Fame and you can write the heck out of a badminton piece. Oh, thank you. But today we got to have you as a corporate competitor. I'm so blessed by your friendship and by your kindness and your wisdom. And I thank you for joining us today. Oh, God bless you. Thank you for that, Don. Thank you. How can you not be energized after listening to Leslie Bizzer? What an amazing storyteller she is and what a gift she has been given over the course of time to learn so many great stories, but then also to share them with us. When she talked about Red Smith walking her through the Kentucky Derby and suggesting to her that you need to make a memory wherever you are. For her, those memories are what has allowed her to grow both as a leader, both as a storyteller, and as one of the all-time greats in a profession that we can all marvel at. She talked about Billie Jean King teaching her, pressure is a privilege, that the opportunity is something we should embrace if we want to be great. We don't need to run from pressure. I love the lesson from her mother about sometimes you need to walk across the street when the sign says not to. She found herself constantly doing exactly that because someone didn't squash her dreams as a 10-year-old. What a gift her mother gave. And then the Lombardi to Madden conversation around not chewing players out after a loss Everybody does that. They're getting chewed out at home. They're getting chewed out at the grocery store. That's not the place for a leader to do their chewing. Chew them out after they've won three straight games. Treat every at-bat as a quality at-bat. There were nuggets of wisdom throughout. Leslie gave it to us today. I'm better as a result of this conversation, and I hope you are too. Thanks again for being a corporate competitor. If you haven't already done so, remember to download the notes I took from today's session on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash 111. Those notes include a reflection question so that you can incorporate our podcast into your personal growth plan. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30-year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager, who did that uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K. How you doing? Hey, Don. How you doing, my man? Great, sir. How are you? What they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399, but for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.